could not have been better set up with the uh, uh, plenius uh, talk here. And the reason there is statistical signal processing is because I'm trained as an electrical engineer. So uh, that is like shout out to that. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. It is an absolute honor to be uh, sharing uh, the insights about my research. And um, today I uh, will be talking about how do we make Canadian healthcare systems AI ready? And uh, the way I'm going to take you uh, through this process is like the journey through bite-sized examples of what power AI and machine learning algorithms hold and uh, how can we actually go about implementing them. I've worked with uh, surgeons over the uh, past few years, surgeons and hospitals and so on. So this comes from a lot of uh, that experience. So uh, to get started, I guess all of us know what the uh, we have discussed in de great detail about the future healthcare challenges of Canada and the world. And one of the main things to uh, that pops up here is the aging world population and actually aging Canadian population, uh, which is projected uh, that by 20. 40, 25% of our population will be above the age of 65. Um, and this is to be juxtaposed with the nursing and medical uh, professional shortages. And we've heard that, uh, like, actually, I was actually surprised to know that our population would actually double, meaning we may not actually be able to meet those needs for healthcare professionals. So that is where um, AI comes in. Uh, these technologies can address our urgent healthcare needs. So the question is, how? How can this be used for a primary healthcare? And so let me actually give you a brief overview of all the things that fall into AI for healthcare. And this is not an exhaustive uh, list. And out of this, uh, my work uh, has focused on uh, telemedicine and uh, physiotherapy here and uh, in, in the context of healthcare monitoring also via telemedicine physiotherapy. Uh, or managing medical records and triage uh, of various information, AI assisted, uh, actually AI um, for surgical skill assessment and surgery, um, and also a number of other, other things. Uh, specifically, uh, I'll be talking about uh, again, bite size, not getting into too much detail about uh, my collaboration with University Health Network on AI for hepatology, uh, again, AI for a physiotherapy. Uh, I will specifically talk about burn surgical candidacy on the second thread uh, and my collaboration with uh, Grand River Hospital, a very recent uh, collaboration on trustworthy AI for healthcare and uh, my previous uh, collaborations uh, with Keck School of Medicine um, and on AI for surgical skill assessment, and finally, a lot of uh, threats on AI for COVID. My research uh, uh, also focuses on other things. Uh, my lab is called Critical Machine Learning Lab at Waterloo, and I work with various companies on uh, what I call AI for intelligent manufacturing, and uh, my work is also supported by uh, companies like NatBlue for AI for aviation operations, which falls into AI for intelligent manufacturing and planning, and other fundamental threads on time series representation learning, transfer learning, deep learning explainability, and physics and form machine learning. So these are like an um, overview of what all I do. And it may appear that there are a lot of things going on, uh, but ultimately the models that we use are very, very transferable. And you'd be surprised uh, how uh, like learnings from a particular area, even something like intelligent uh, monitoring um, in, in manufacturing floors can actually be used for healthcare. So uh, that is the thread that connects um, all of these things. Okay. So the first, uh, I'll take you uh, through uh, some examples of AI for forecasting uh, patient outcomes in primary healthcare applications. So here, the, the stage is essentially, we are thinking about how can we improve the current way in which we can assist clinicians? We're not trying to replace them. Uh, we have to be, uh, we are actually trying to make uh, um, provide them with information and interpretability uh, and then this AI-based uh, decision-making so that they can make good decisions. Um, on this thread uh, with UHN and Dr. Mamta Bhatt, we actually look at um, the how to, not, not prioritize, but how to actually predict a wait list outcomes after a patient gets waitlisted for liver transplantation. Uh, 
And we're specifically looking at uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, a very extreme form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease prevalent in an aging population, which is known as NASH. And this population is very special in the sense that the current predictive models, which is known as a MELD score, the scores that are being used, the predictive power for that particular populations are not that good. So what happens is, because they all they are a, belong to a particular age, and they all, all almost always have some other comorbidities, they're almost never prioritized to receive transplantation. Um, and as we, as I just motivated, uh, by 2040, we will have 25% of our population falling into this category. And this is one of the most common indication for liver transplantation today. And the thing that I learned about liver specifically, which surprised me, I don't think it will surprise a lot of you here, is that that is one organ which we cannot make an artificial version of. It performs so many functions in our body that we literally, the only option is that you have to have transplantation. So here, what we are trying to do is actually predicting future trajectories of patients once they get weight listed for uh, transplantation. So we are going from some attributes of patients to a time series, in fact. And, uh, and I guess this is a more comprehensive view of it. But ultimately, what we are able to do is to say, you know what, this patient is actually this it's, it's more likely, so we follow a competing risk model. So we have, it's more likely to actually receive a transplant versus dying. So this actually can help uh, uh, the clinicians uh, on the ground. And now on this thread, we are also looking at donor recipient matching so that we uh, improve the outcomes for uh, this particular group. Next on um, a primary healthcare, we have a predicting burn surgical uh, candidacy. So uh, this has an interesting story. Um, um, I was a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellow at University of Southern California, and I received an email from our plastic surgery uh, division saying, hey, uh, can you help us like, predict uh, if I should perform surgery on this candidate or not, looking at just the burn images? And I said, no, that not, does not sound like a good idea at all. And then they told me, actually, right now, a clinician has a 50-50% chance if like they should have operated or not. I'm like, okay, that's, that's where we can actually do something better than that. So uh, we ended up working a very short uh, development cycle here. And this actually goes back to some of the discussions we have been having that the technology exists. It is a lot of it is about data and getting data into place. So we were actually able to uh, build the model, test it out and actually even publish pretty, pretty fast uh, pace uh, in a couple of months, uh, even developing an app for, uh, for the folks at, um, of course, they're for internal testing if this were ever to be deployed. But they were now able to actually take, take Im images as soon as a patient is uh, admitted with burn wounds. They would just take pictures, put in some information, and um, we, we actually improved uh, the performance of like as compared to a surgeon of 23 to 88%. 88% is like a novice, uh, like a surgeon. So um, this actually tells us, so I'm not saying go and deploy it. What, it. what this tells us is technology exists and we can actually do way better. And of course, I would not deploy this in any new, con the new conditions uh, because LA uh, County Burn Center is one of the most diverse in the US with high volume of uh, patients coming in. And if we were to apply it in the Canadian context, there has to be very good validation and actually continual monitoring of these things. So, uh, but this too shows the potential of what is possible if we have uh, everything um, in place regarding uh, data. Now, changing uh, gears a little bit, uh, we have been hearing about AI for medical training. Um, and uh, this is, this was, um, uh, I will discuss two things here. Uh, one, a much more positive thing, the other, a cautionary tale. And a uh, first of these is um, a collaboration with Keck School of Medicine at USC. Uh, so we, I worked with a urologist and we were, um, they were trying to see if doctors can 
actually practice their skill in a virtual reality environment and um, how this, they found that it actually correlated very well with their performance in real world surgeries. So then the question was, can we provide them with some feedback on how well they're doing when they're practicing? The only feedback at till that point was time to completion. How quickly can you do something? But that is not a very good indication. Uh, so what we and, uh, did was for each suturing step, a doctor, um, so that GIF actually shows you the kind of steps that one has to take in that virtual reality environment. And we were actually able to give them fine grained feedback on, yes, you did this step correctly, but not this other step. However, uh, with anything healthcare, there is a lot of nuance involved. And in machine learning, a lot of times we think, hey, given this is, this is the uh, attributes of this particular person, and this is the outcome, um, can you train a model which can predict a particular outcome? But there's an inherent uncertainty, because even surgeons don't agree with each other if a certain step was performed correctly or not. Even when those things are highly structured, they're exactly told how to do surgery, uh, su suturing steps, but everybody has a different opinion. And this brings up another thing about data collection is um, in healthcare, there would be always this ambiguity. So a lot of work has to also go into um, like understanding uh, what we were talking about yesterday as the quality of your data and sometimes realizing that you have to live with uh, some uncertainty. Um, yeah, so we did develop a, a method to kind of uh, try uh, trying to find out which uh, labels were or which data was actually more trustworthy than the others and uh, trying to find that sweet spot where we can actually uh, train a, a trustworthy model. Uh, on the other thread, we also did some transfer learning uh, uh, applications, because now we can think about uh, if, let's say, all of us are surgeons, then each of, even when each of us, we perform a particular task, we might have slight variations. And I might not do the exact same task the same, like in the same way. The problem is that because we are surgeons, then it would be very expensive to get like samples from each one of us. Our time is extremely valuable. So this paradigm of learning from limited data is a very popular one in machine learning. Um, however, I should say, it just can, uh, you still need data on the whole. All I'm saying is that in, at an individual level, you may not have a lot of data. So we did um, some of, uh, develop some of those uh, models and it did improve our performance over, uh, overall. Um, Finally, um, we have been hearing, uh, at least I've, I came across certain papers uh, on how large language models can actually be used to train clinicians. And on, on this thread, uh, I enlisted uh, like one of my uh, undergraduate uh, researchers, um, and he looked into various things saying, hey, people are saying that large language models or chat GPT pass the medical licensing exam. So can we look, take a critical uh, look into it? And uh, surpri uh, not surprisingly, I guess, uh, some of these authors have a company which uh, like is pushing for those kind of uh, medical education things. Um, but we wanted to, um, we also looked into um, how um, can this really be uh, used for uh, training at this point, right? future, like we will see how, how what the future holds for this. Um, so, and the other question that we asked is, um, a lot of people will start self-diagnosing themselves. If people were already turning to Google uh, for self-diagnosis, uh, people will be self-diagnosing their ailments using ChatGPT or things like that. So how, and, and in those situations, in previous works, they were like licensing exams, they have question, very well-structured question, and certain options to choose from. But that is not how real world works. You actually just ask a question and it may be very, very ambiguous. Um, so long story short, we came up with actually a methodology to like um, a more rigorous way to test um, these kind of things for uh, medical um, questionnaires and can actually be used in other contexts as well. Uh, but what we found was in fact, and we enlisted two human evaluators, uh, uh, it only got it right 17% of the time. And even when we asked ChatGPT to rate itself, it only 
said that it was right 23% of the time. So, um, and then we looked at the right answers and only those we dropped uh, random sentences, all combinations of random sentences drop off from these questions. And uh, we also found that it is um, on that particular um, instance, right about here, it actually is now less confident and gets it wrong. So it's so it is not. Uh, so the moral of the story is that at this point, um, there is it is extremely it is actually more cautious when it's um, correct. And it's uh, uh, in and in very confident in language, like not from these spots, but in language it is very confident when it's incorrect. Uh, so, yeah, we have to be careful about uh, these kind of. Uh, yes, there is a case in which AI can be used for skill, uh, skill assessment, and to help surgeons, let's say, improve their skills. But these, this at this stage may not be the way. Um, finally, uh, connecting to uh, to. Um, I guess not finally, but two talks uh, prior to my uh, particular talk, um, I worked on a lot of COVID-19 uh, pandemic threads. And um, one of them was actually predicting spatial temporal risk scores using high resolution mobility data. So Microsoft uh, graciously donated mobility data, and this goes on to Plinio Stock. They have all of your mobility data. Um, and uh, we ended up simulating um, COVID-19 spread on top of it. So like compartmental models. And uh, using those, we were actually able to see day by day, which area in a particular city are actually more, have a higher risk. So this actually potentially could be used for public um, health. Now, going back to some discussion about synthetic data where it may not be privacy preserving, um, our question was, hey, this mobility data is, uh, we can't release it. And it's like just being gifted to us by Microsoft. What can we do? So we actually, in fact, also developed a model which can generate synthetic data, spatial temporal data. Um, and the only, so we were able to do with this data, but again, with publicly available data, if the data set is small, it may not be privacy preserving. And the reasoning is this. At the end of the day, synthetic data generation means that we are trying to actually learn a distribution from which the data comes. Uh, once I have the distribution, it's like you having your uh, favorite uh, mathematical like software saying Gaussian, generate 100 samples from this Gaussian, right? Um, but learning, like knowing that it's a Gaussian or learning that particular distribution is a lot of work and it takes a lot of data. So if you don't have enough data, you might have just memorized what happens when you have a particular input. And that's where some of the privacy concerns may come in. But you have more data, it actually may be more privacy preserving and actually can work. So in fact, this calls that everybody, all the hospital systems should join in in the synthetic data it's either we all get it or none of us gets it. So there's like more uh, motivation for us to share data. Anyway, so moving quickly back to uh, my slides, uh, I also worked on um, some, uh, actually one of the first works on COVID-19 misinformation back in March, 2020. And we were trying to track how uh, a particular Twitter uh, message actually spreads across the world. Surprising the models used in both of the top two uh, more, uh, like top two examples here are the same. It's a Hox process. So it's, it's very interesting how it's the same model, but in different, you can use it in different contexts for di learning different kinds of things. Uh, and finally, also for COVID um, epidemic spread and what is the effect of a particular policy intervention. Let's say I use my first word to say, let me close down that particular area for a day. What would, how would the spread actually change and these kind of things. Um, okay, so let's actually revisit, oh yeah, let's actually revisit how I motivated uh, some of these things is, hey, we are all aging at any given point in time and Canada is, uh, would have a huge uh, aging population and we have a nurse uh, nursing shortage as well. However, we also have a huge problem of bias. 
in, in the system. And what this means is, although AI-powered healthcare technologies can address our urgent healthcare needs, uh, they can also reinforce existing biases. So there is no way to actually know the impact of these um, these uh, these biases uh, or unbiased things uh, if we do not adequately record them. So on our last uh, topic here, I'm currently working with Grand River Hospital. And because getting access to their data and going through, the, actually even finding where that data is, is, is challenging if, if because it's stored and siloed off. We are currently looking at uh, what uh, Helen referred to as the MIMIC data set, one of the most popular data sets um, for healthcare research, mostly because they were able to release individualized um, healthcare information. And this comes from this particular hospital in Boston and used across the world, right? Um, and if we just even think about the demographics of Boston, it is definitely not the same as all the countries that I show here. So, um, and uh, like the plots at the bottom are essentially showing the, um, the makeup of, of that particular uh, data set. And in fact, in US, there is a huge, uh, even in my liver transplantation work, we see, uh, by the way, there also we work with US data because that is the most accessible. Um, we see that the uh, impact of your insurance status is huge. So if you have insurance, you get good. And, and that is not the case in Canada. So even these kind of things, may impact um, that you cannot just train something naively. You have to be, uh, you have to understand the context in which even if you want to transfer, even the features may not align. That's that's the other challenge. So uh, to, to kind of uh, conclude this talk, uh, what needs to happen um, for to make Canada AI ready? Um, first of all, we need to understand that uh, all data is not uh, created equal. Uh, data from US, which most of the researchers use in the Canadian context, it may be completely different. There are transfer learning mod, uh, algorithms that we can use, but we just need to be aware of this particular fact. Um, next, if there is no data, there is no machine learning. There is no, as, as uh, Gautam and I were discussing yesterday, and uh, most important thing to communicate, there is no magic. If, like, there, you can't create something from nothing, you have to have data to create meaningful um, meaningful insights, what uh, John was uh, uh, also referring to. Finally, uh, the next, not finally, uh, next is uh, annotating healthcare data is extremely expensive. So, and uh, there is also uh, a lot of nuance. So when we ask people about something, they may have different opinions and we have to live with it. You can't just say, I will take majority vote over. You have to think about better ways to encode that nuance because we want our AI models to be to also communicate nuance rather than absolute certainty. Um, the next um, thing is about that actually we are never done model training. It's not like I develop a model and I, and I just leave. I'm like, I'm done to the next project. You have to maintain it. The burn surgical uh, uh, candidacy project that I'm talking about may have very bad results the, the next time because demographics changed or doctors changed or whatever happened. So there has to be continuous monitoring all these things. And then even the machine learning industry is dealing with uh, this, these kind of things and it's called the area of um, ML ops. It actually pretty much looks into this. Um, and uh, we do need to collect demographic information. This is one thing that even comes from uh, my work with Grand River Hospital is uh, they may not be actually, we may not be, they may not be act Actually collecting that data in a way that is accessible. If I don't know what are my outcomes for different groups, genders, and various things, I will not know if my machine learning model is fair and reliable and trustworthy. Um, the next is that ML infrastructure is not cheap and it's very, very complex. So we can't just expect every hospital system to figure it out on, on their own. And uh, that is where um, my next point is it takes a village. It takes different uh, levels of uh, administrators to actually come together and help and make this happen. Of course, we have gone in very detailed about cyber privacy and cyber security um, uh, issues and also the need for 
interoperability with, which came up yesterday as well and this is like a news article from a day ago three three days ago from us where they rolled out uh, electronic health record software for uh, veteran affairs and in fact because it had so many glitches they spent like 20 billion dollars or something on it but so many glitches that a lot of people actually died so this work this has our work has a real impact both ways we have to be thinking about these things um next uh, as i said the more we share the more um the hospitals can share that data um and uh, which which takes us to the first part of today's uh, talks um the better that's how we actually can get um privacy preserving uh, technology as well and it is not just me uh, this conversation these conversations have been happening for a really long time yesterday i learned that for 60 years and uh, in fact this is uh, a snippet from uh, the uh, expert advisory group um group's report which exactly echoes what i just said and these are all the pain points that um all of all of us are discussing so i think uh, and then they in fact also have the solutions for these things and we have to we have to adopt them uh, it is very difficult to do uh, that kind of research and have that kind of impact anyway um to end my talk um we need human centered ai and waterloo is very well equipped to do it we have even in my department we have expertise from um like our social scientists and we have operations research people and machine learning people and across the university also the kind of expertise that we have is uh, very very different and also the mental like the way we think about things uh, we work closely with industry and it is very fast paced if we get the data i'm very sure that we are we can actually generate meaningful things useful things at a very small scale and that's uh i spread through it but yeah feel free to ask any questions thank you